Hi everyone. Uh, today's uh, topic is telescopes, uh, the, how telescopes work and um, a little bit of, about imaging. Uh, before I do the lecture, I want to talk a little bit about how a glass lens can be used in imaging. Here's just a glass lens that has spherical surfaces. Uh, every one of these surfaces is a section of a sphere, as though this was chipped off of a great big spherical piece of glass. And I just want to show you how you can make an image on a blank sheet of paper with one of these. So I've turned off the lights in the room, and uh, here is my clipboard with paper on it, and here's a glass lens. And I've got the door open to the back to the uh, storeroom of the physics lab, and hopefully you can see I'm making an image. I'm just holding this glass lens in front of this sheet of paper and it's making an image of what's inside that room, the door, the open door. It's upside down and backwards uh, so you can see the lights on the ceiling which looks like it's on the floor here. But uh, that's all it takes to make an image. Okay, you can, so you can see there's no big mystery as to how images form. All you need is a, a piece of glass or something with uh, spherical surfaces on it. A spherical surface is actually the easiest kind of geometrical surface to to carve onto a solid object. So people have been doing this for thousands of years and they've known about the idea of imaging all that time. Uh, in the present day of course we have a, a more sophisticated theory of how all the imaging works and we have better lenses than ever before. But people have been making images for a very long time. So uh, telescopes and other imaging devices uh, use this idea of imaging. So here's, here's another form of imaging that doesn't involve refraction through a glass lens. This is called a pinhole camera. If you have this box completely dark instead of, except for light coming through one little tiny hole, you can see that photons from the top of the tree are going to go through that hole and wind up at the bottom over on the image of the tree and an image will actually form in there. This is not a real efficient way to make a camera because the only light that makes that contributes to the image has to go through that teeny weeny little hole. But it is a way of making an image. A more practical way is to have a glass lens that focuses light. So you can see these parallel rays come from the left. They're refracted in this glass lens because of the curved surface and focus to a point. It is at the plane of that point, the vertical plane where that point is, that an image will form. And here is something like I just showed you. Here's a tree to one side and then there's a the light is shining through the lens onto that uh, uh, screen over there and forming the image of the tree. Now there's a bunch of way that this is applied in nature and, um, and in technology. For example, this is what the human eye is structured like. So there's a, a, a lens in here, it's not a glass lens, it's some sort of made of some sort of transparent protein. Uh, the light comes in the front of the eye, is focused by this lens and forms an image on the inside back surface of the light where there are light sensitive neurons called retina, thousands of them, and the image forms on those retina and uh, and the retina take take that information back to the brain, which is where you perceive it. So, so uh, imaging occurs in the human eye and many, many other types of eyes of other species uh, because of the this same process that occurs with a glass lens. Now here's a camera. So here's uh, the glass lens of a camera. Normally, this the shutter is closed. See, this red thing is supposed to be the, a, a door. Normally the film on the inside of the camera is in complete darkness, right? But when you take a picture, it opens that shutter for a moment and allowing light in and the, the lens makes an image on the film plane. This film is what? It's a piece of plastic covered with light-sensitive chemicals that when the image is formed on there, it, uh, it sort of, those chemicals undergo chemical reactions and it sort of saves the image on that piece of plastic film. And then you roll the, uh, the wheels with the plastic film, advance it to the next frame, and eventually when you 
finish exposing all that film, you take it to get it processed, and they give you prints. Now, these days, of course, the uh, most cameras that you have, like the camera in your phone, are, they don't use photographic film, right? There's an electronic device that serves the same purpose as in a uh, film camera. And this is an example of, of one type of them. So this plane right here is divided up into millions of little pixels, each of which is, uh, is separately sensitive to light. So that when image, image forms on there, each pixel can be saved and you get, it breaks this, the image down into thousands of tiny little bits and then it's saved in the memory of your phone or camera um, and you know, reassembled so that you can see it on the screen. Uh, so all video cameras uh, work this way, all the, the cameras in your phones and you know, most cameras these days are digital cameras as opposed to film cameras but they all work the same way. So here's a pretty fancy camera with a fancy lens on it. This is, I guess, a telephoto lens for taking pictures of sporting events or whatever. This is more sophisticated than the, than the camera in your phone because it's, it's specialized for you know, really high quality pictures of fast moving things. But again, you have lenses in here and here's the camera back here where the, uh, where the sensor is placed. This is the world's largest uh, refracting camera, in other words, that uses a glass lens to make an image. This is obviously taken a long time ago, in the, probably the 1920s or something. This is a, a, a huge refracting telescope that is still a functioning telescope, but its lens is, is about 40 inches in diameter. So this is a very large lens. This is very, very difficult to make a lens this large that still that still images properly. So this, I think, is, the, is still the largest one in the world. Most of the bigger telescopes these days, they focus light not by refracting through a lens, but by reflecting on a curved mirror. So here you see the side view of a dish-shaped mirror where light is reflecting off this curved surface and it's being focused by reflection instead of refraction. So the light is not having to go through the material, it just reflects off the surface. Turns out for larger telescopes, the easiest way to build them to make them image properly is by building a reflector telescope. Small lenses are easy enough to build, but the bigger and bigger the lens has to get, the harder and harder it is to make it image properly. So, so all the big telescopes in the world are reflecting telescopes. So here you see, you know, the image of some moon or something being formed. The moon is evidently off to the right, and an image of it is forming there. And here are some great big reflecting telescopes. So, uh, trying to see if there's something to get a sense of size here. Well, here's the mirror of one of these things. And you can see this guy standing down here. I guess that's his reflection in the mirror. But this, all these hexa hexagonal things are sections of the mirror. So it was, the mirror was made in individual uh, pieces and then assembled into this great big hexagon. So this is a very large astronomical telescope and it's a reflecting telescope. Uh, this is a telescope that's being planned by uh, the Europeans and it's going to be called the European Extremely Large Telescope and you can see these automobiles down here and inside of it you can see the size of the mirror. This is going to be humongous. Now the advantage of building a bigger telescope like this, one of the main advantages is that it makes it more sensitive, right? Uh, these stars out there don't care that we want to observe them, so uh, they just their light goes out into space in all directions. The more of the light you can catch from a light source, the more you can know about that light source. So our pupils are pretty tiny because we don't, you know, we operate in fairly bright light. We need a fairly small fraction of the light that, that reflects off of objects that we want to see. We need only need a small fraction in order to perceive them correctly. But here they're, they want to look at these extremely faint light sources very far away in the universe. And so they want to build big telescopes. This is an example of a radio telescope. So this is sensitive to frequencies that are much lower in the radio part of the spectrum 
than the optical frequencies that we perceive, the visible light that we perceive. And you can see that this, again, is this, it's a reflecting telescope. Here's this dish-shaped thing. The radio photons come in from outer space. They're reflected off of here, and they focus on this instrument up here. This is the largest radio telescope in the world. This is about a thousand feet in diameter. It's in Puerto Rico. And this is the most sensitive radio telescope in the world. I think the Chinese now have a, a somewhat bigger one. I haven't heard much about how it performs. But um, this telescope's been in existence since the early 1960s. So this is, uh, this is the largest uh, telescope of any kind in the world. Now, this diagram uh, sort of illustrates how uh, the bigger a telescope is, the more sensitive it, is, sensitive it is to a, a given light source. So here's, this is supposed to look like a kiddie pool and a cup sitting in a yard somewhere. They both collected rain, right? When it rains, the kiddie pool and the cup fill up to the same depth, but that, trans that translates to a very large, very much larger number of water droplets in the case of the kiddie pool than the cup. So more of the water that comes from the sky is collected. This is directly analogous to the fact that the, from a given light source you want to collect as much light as possible if you're trying to study a very faint light source out there in the universe. And the bigger the telescope you use to do that, the easier it is to get a lot of light so you can so you can get more details about the nature of the light that's coming from that source. Now, there's another reason for using a bigger telescope. It turns out that the bigger the telescope, the more clearly it views the universe. So, uh, there's a measure of how clearly an optical instrument can see something, and it's called the angular resolution. The angular resolution is, say your telescope is over here, and there's two light sources out. What is the smallest angle between those two light sources that can be resolved from each other? In other words, if two stars are really close together, at some point if they're too close together, the telescope won't be able to tell that there's two light sources. It'll just look like one, and that light will be mixed together, and you won't be able to study the light sources individually, right? So this is a, a general measure for uh, the, the ability of an optical instrument to, to resolve what it's looking at. It's called the, the angular resolution. And that angle, theta, is inversely proportional to the diameter of the telescope. In other words, the bigger the diameter of the telescope, the smaller that angle is. And so the, the closer these two points of light can be together and be resolved from each other. Now, this, uh, this angular resolution is kind of a physical limit. This is as good as you can do if you build the reflecting mirror as perfectly as you possibly can. In other words, this, this is a foundational limit limited by the laws of physics. So, I mean, it's obviously possible to build a mirror that's not made very well, and then the angular resolution won't be as good as indicated by this equation. But, but if you build it as perfectly as you can, this is the physical limit that you reach. But the bottom line is, the bigger the telescope, the more clearly it can see what it's looking at. So there's another reason for building bigger telescopes. And you can see the difference between two telescopes here. Uh, here's a picture of a galaxy taken with a smaller telescope, another one taken with a, a larger telescope. And you can see more detail, make out more individual stars and stuff, and you can study it in more detail. Now, uh, I think I talked about this when I talked about light, but the Earth's atmosphere is not transparent to all frequencies of light. It is opaque, meaning it blocks light from most for, to most frequencies of light. So for at the very short wavelengths, high frequencies like X-ray, uh, gamma, uh, ultraviolet, it's completely opaque, 100% opaque. And then there's a window in the visible part of the spectrum, which is why we can see through the atmosphere. And, uh, and then it's kind of choppy in the infrared. And then there's a big <clears throat> range of wavelengths in the radio part of the spectrum to which the Earth's atmosphere is transparent. And this is why we can communicate using radio frequencies 
why you can listen to you know FM 97 or whatever and our cell phones work because the the air is transparent to these frequencies now as a result of the opacity of the atmosphere to most frequencies astronomers have had to put telescopes into space in order to see the universe the objects in the universe in these different in these various frequencies like infrared like ultraviolet and x-ray and gamma ray and i want to just want to show you a few of these telescopes this is the chandra x-ray telescope here it is being lifted out of the uh, cargo bay of the space telescope this is when it was launched into space on the on the space shuttle and um, this right here is a cover that blocks light from coming in and then when they open it up when they want to use it and uh, and this is a very important x-ray telescope that has um, that's contributed much to our understanding of the universe it turns out most stars emit x-rays and you can tell some things about their activities based on that here's the Hubble Space Telescope which you've probably heard of before this uh, is sensitive to a range from in the infrared way up into the ultraviolet including the visible part of the spectrum now the Earth's atmosphere is transparent in the visible, right? But this actually has an advantage because it doesn't have to look through the Earth's atmosphere. Its view of the universe is even more clear than big telescopes on the surface of the Earth. So Hubble has been very important in uncovering various things about the universe because of the fact that it's in space. And it's been in space for nearly 30 years now and is still a productive scientific instrument. This is the Spitzer Infrared Telescope. I think this is the biggest, fanciest infrared telescope that's in space at the moment. And um, turns out most of the radiation that stars emit is in the infrared. So this gathers information about them from that. This is SWIFT. This has got three telescopes on it. There's a gamma ray instrument, uh, an, a uh, UV visible instrument, and an X-ray instrument. And um, the reason this was developed is because in the 1960s, people found out that there are these bursts of gamma rays, high-frequency photons, coming out of deep space, and nobody knew where they came from because the burst would begin and end in a few seconds, so they couldn't focus other telescopes on it to see what was going on. So this is, it's called SWIFT because it can detect a gamma ray burst and then swing over and point its other telescopes at it to find out what's happening. And interestingly, gamma rays can't be focused. Their, their wavelength is too short to be focused. And so this uses a different kind of system. You can't, actually can't make an image of something in gamma rays, but you can tell what direction it's coming from with this fancy coded aperture thing. This is the an instrument that, that part of the instrument that that is presently on board the swift instrument that's up in space um, and here's a schematic of the instrument here's that what's called a coded aperture it puts a shadow on this gamma ray detector down here now uh, the way these blocks are arranged is completely random so depending on which direction the, the gamma rays come from in space the ins the telescope can tell which direction they're coming from by the shadow that it leaves on the instrument, if that makes any sense. But that's how they tell what direction the gamma rays are coming from. And then these telescopes over here are the UV uh, slash visible and the X-ray telescope that, that are used once the uh, location of the source is known. Now this is the uh, uh, James Webb telescope that's going to be the successor of the uh, of the Hubble telescope. It's been delayed a number of times, but it's hopefully going to be launched into space in 2020. And uh, it has a much larger aperture and should be a much more uh, sensitive instrument than anything that's ever been in space before. Okay, so there's just a little bit about telescopes.